Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. It's good to see you out here on a beautiful Wednesday evening and uh, I'm fired up tonight and I want to tell you why. Uh, Sunday afternoon right after church, all of our uh, ministry staff uh, took off to Lexington Airport and flew to Savannah, Georgia. We've been in a two-day ministry conference. Uh, we're 85 different churches. We met together, ministry leaders, and uh, worshiped and encouraged each other and studied and uh, prepare ourselves for this next part of our journey. And uh, somebody asked me, how, how was it? And I said, it's like getting new spark plugs in a very old engine. <laughs> so if my block cracks tonight while we're here because I've got new plugs, we'll, we'll deal with that then. But it was a blessing and uh, uh, what, a, what a blessing it, it has been. But it's good to be back home. Got in at 1.30 a.m. this morning and uh, it's been a long day. But uh, I'm looking forward to tonight's uh, session. And I, uh, Jed asked me, was tonight going to be as good as last week? And I, I don't know. Let's hope so, okay? Let's hope so. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your church. Uh, we pray tonight a simple prayer. Um, open our minds to understand the scripture. Because if, if we can know the word, we can know you. For you are the word. And uh, tonight, that's our prayer. If you don't open our minds, we won't be able to understand. We won't be able to experience you tonight. But I believe that's your will. So we pray in accordance to your will. Open our minds to, tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let me kind of give you a precursor. I won't do it again after tonight, but we might have some new people. The first five sessions in this 13-part series are going to be based on a book I read several years ago by Randy Alcorn called Heaven. We're then going to have one session on hell, and that's really not true because there's kind of a, about a half a session in, about hell in here tonight. But there will be one dedicated session to hell, um, and that'll be enough, trust me. The final seven sessions are going to be the three questions that Jesus, his disciples, ask him uh, a couple days before he dies. Very important questions that affect everybody in this room about how he answers them. Uh, when will these things happen? What will the sign of, the, of your coming, your return be? And what is the sign of the end of the world? So that'll be the last seven sessions. So last week we talked about the wonder of heaven. And that's why uh, I got a lot of feedback from last Wednesday night. Uh, just so encouraging because uh, everybody needs to know what's out in front of us. And heaven's coming. You, you know what? I stood back there a minute ago and said, heaven's coming. We don't know the schedule, but I can guarantee it's coming. And, and that's important for us to hold on to. It's a real place where real people are going to spend a real eternity with a real Savior. It's a place beyond human understanding, but not beyond our ability to believe. Satan is a liar. He wants us to think of heaven as a ghostly, boring place without physical existence. So he can keep us content with earthly stuff and distracted from the treasure of heaven. This past Sunday, I preached a sermon about the seeds and the sower and the seed snatcher. And I, I made a statement. I'm going to say it again tonight. I believe that of those th first three, the footpath, the, the rocky soil, and the thorny people, the American church is struggling with category number three. The deceitfulness of wealth, the lure of wealth, the lure of getting so attached to stuff down here. Um, it gets you distracted. It takes your eyes off of the prize. And the earth, Satan makes things down here start to look equivalent to or better than. You're not longing for heaven because you got too much stuff around you. And you get become distracted. And, and, um, and how does that end in Jesus' parable of the sower? That doesn't end well. Those first three categories, nobody wants to say it out loud. Those first three categories in that parable of the sower are lost. <laughs> Unless they repent and turn, they're lost. They're lost people. Satan wants us to trade the temporary for the eternal. 
a bowl of soup for the birthright of the king. What a stupid transaction. A moment for eternity. God tells us to keep our minds and our eyes fixed on heaven, not on earth. Fix, fix your, fix, you know, calibrate your life's compass to heaven. And don't let somebody try to come and take you off course. Last week we closed by reading these verses in the first person. And I want to do it again. I want to do it again. So get your paper. I want you to, we're going to do it out loud together. And, and if, you, if you don't mean it, don't say it. Because it just puts you in a bad place with God. Because our words matter. But if you mean it, say it with me. I since then, what? What did I do there? (laughs) Since then, I have been raised with Christ. I will set my heart on things above heaven, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I set my mind on things above heaven, not on earthly things. For I died, and my life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is my life, appears, then I will also appear with him in glory. Now, that's our game plan. This is it. I'm going to set my eyes on heaven. What you're looking at is what you're going to hit. I've not met very many people that didn't think they were going to go to heaven. I've not met very many people that didn't think they were going to go to heaven. I've had exceptions. Let me tell you about one. Uh, There's this guy, obviously I'm not going to tell you his name, and uh, I've known him for years. And I'm standing in his front yard one day, a few years ago, and I've been trying to get him to come to church. He came a little bit, and then he fell off, and finally he just kind of threw up the don't, don't bother me anymore position. And I just looked at him, and I said this, what's going to happen to you when you die? And he looked me square in the eye and he said, I think I'll go to hell. And I didn't know what to say. He recognized what most people don't recognize, that I'm lost. And and I had a chance, and and since then I've I've had a lot of chances. Why? And he's got some deep-rooted past issues that he, he can't seem to get over. He doesn't feel like he's worthy, and which I've said, that's all of us, buddy. That's it. But in reality, most people don't come to that place. Most people have the idea that if there is such a place, God surely will let everybody in. I've been to funerals of non-believers and heard them say they're in a better place. In fact, let's just be honest, it's, it's funeral language. Everybody says it, and it doesn't matter who you are or what funeral you go to. Now, it's, it's logical for me if a believer says about a believer they're in a better place. It's logical. It, it has a logic to me. But if they're all non-believers, and they've never been to church, never confessed Christ, and they say they're in a better place, It's a curious statement. It's a hopeful statement. In funeral homes, people say he was a good man. That's common language. In fact, I've never heard anyone say he was a jerk. (laughs) And I I think about that for a while. I've never heard anybody in a funeral home say, well, he was a jerk. Did you know him? Yeah, he was a jerk. You know why? Because all the people who thought that, they don't go to visitation. (laughs) They all stayed home. So how good is good enough to go to heaven? He's a good man. So obviously in their brain when they say that, they've got a scale that has a threshold by which if you can break that threshold, you're going to heaven. So how good is good enough? Wouldn't that be a great question when it comes to heaven and hell? Does everyone go to heaven? Is everyone in a better place? 
Let me tell you a story. I'll never forget a story. Uh, most of y'all know I used to work for a Japanese company before I went into the ministry. I, I've been to Japan about 25 times in my life. And um, I had a bunch of Japanese uh, captive in a dinner meeting one night. And I, I brought up the question. I just went around the room to the Japanese guys and I said, what, what do you think happens when, to you when you die? Now, this was right before I quit my job and went into ministry. And, and, and I thought, if they fire me, it won't matter anyway. <laughs> so what do you think is going to happen when you die? If you want to start a good conversation with somebody, do that. It's good. It's really good. It's not offensive. So one of them, the, the first one, uh, he says, um, kind of logically, he, he, he said he was a Buddhist. He said, I believe I just fade to unconsciousness. It just kind of just fade to black. There's nothing over there. Uh, one of them said he believed in reincarnation. And he said he believed that if he led a good life, um, and, and we were in Kentucky when this happened, and he says, I believe if you lead a good life, you'll come back like a horse, because in Kentucky, horses live better than Japanese do in Japan. <laughs> and, and he said, um, if you lead a good life, you'll come back as a horse. You lead a bad life, you'll come, you'll, you'll come back as a pig or maybe a rodent or, you know, something not so nice. Um, so I asked, once I got everybody involved in the conversation, I said, so how good is good enough to be a horse? If you're going to bet your eternity on it, shouldn't you know where the break point is? So how good is good enough? Nobody could answer the question because there is no such answer. Is everyone going to heaven? So let's ask Jesus. Wouldn't that make the most sense that you ask the guy that's from heaven who has the keys? Wouldn't it make more sense than anything on planet earth to ask the one who is from heaven how you can get into heaven when you cross over? He is the gate and the way, and I'm going to tell you, he is the key to heaven's door. There is one key. He has it. He is it. So jo John 10, 7, therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. And all who ever came before me were thieves and robbers. Now I, I want to insert something. These thieves and robbers pretend like they're a gate. They pretend like they're a way to God. But the key that they hold doesn't open heaven's door. They're thieves and robbers. They're, they're key. If you ride your ride with them, you're going to get to the end of the ride, and they're going to put their key in the door of heaven, and it ain't going to open the door. They're thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to the thieves and robbers. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Now, now when he says he's the gate, the gate is an entry point into the presence of God. That's what he's talking about. Now, let's go to John 14, 6. Jesus again. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's, a, he's, he's the gate, the door, the passageway, the portal, whatever you want to call it, between our world and that world called heaven, the eternal realm of God. Revelation 3, 7. The angel of the church in Philadelphia, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right. And by the way, I want you to know, this is Jesus dictating to John. He said, John, write this down. What, to the angel of the church at Philadelphia. Hey, John, write this. Write this. That's what, that's what this is happening. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. Holds a key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Now, what do you think the key of David's going to open and shut? 
He is the access point to God the Father. He is the access point to life itself. And we're going to get into what it means to have non-life, but have existence. He says that he holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. Let me illustrate that. I believe right now that we're in a church age from the day of Pentecost until the return of Christ. That on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the people, they were Jewish people gathered at the temple in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. What, what happened that day is God opened a door. What he opens, no one can shut. He opened a door. The door is the church age. It opened wide. Now, for 2,000 years, that door's been open. What he opens, no one can shut. Who's this letter to? To the church and Phil- to the church. He's writing a letter. What the door I open, no one can shut. But here, here's, the, here's the other side. The door he closes, no one can open. There is a day. I believe it's soon. He's going to shut that door. And no one's going to open it. And where you are, on the inside or the outside of that door, it's forever. This is big. This is eternal. Jesus is the door. He is the gate. He is the way. Jesus holds the key to heaven, death, and hell. All three. Heaven, death, and hell. He's telling the truth or he's telling a liar. Uh, he, or he is a liar. L- listen, it, it's this. Somewhere in your life, you're going to figure out what you're going to do with Jesus. So, that guy I told you I was talking to in his front yard, he's figuring out whether he knows or not what he's going to do with Jesus. Everybody's got to figure out what you're going to do with Jesus. Either, either he's, he's a truth teller or he's a liar. He, he, he's one or the other. You can't say, well, I, he's a good teacher. I, I had this conversation with somebody recently, and they, I tried to get them, to, who, who is Jesus? I believe he's a good man, he's a good teacher. But, but he's not who you think he is. <laughs> to which I said, well, if, if, if he's not the son of God, he's a liar. Then how would he be a good man? Because he claimed to be the son of God. Now, I believe him. So you don't believe he's the son of God. So you're saying because he's a liar, he's a good man. You see, there's a conflict in the idea. Either he's telling the truth or he's a liar. I believe he's telling the truth. Now, then listen carefully. In Revelation 1.18, Jesus said these words, I am the living one. I was dead. He had a physical body. He died. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. He can't die now. And I hold the keys to death and Hades or hell in other translations. So I, if I had my keys, I put them backstage, I'd, I'd jingle them right now. He's got the keys to that door. I hold the keys to death and hell. I guess you could call it the master key. I got one key on my keychain that opens every door in this 36,000 square foot campus. It's a master key. And it'll open any door anywhere on this campus. Jesus is a master key. And he says it's a narrow gate that he has a key to. Why? Why is it narrow? It's a narrow gate that he has the key to. It's not narrow because he didn't make it big enough. It's narrow because he knows in advance who's going to believe in him and who's going to choose him to be the gate. He knows in advance. (coughs) So let's do something. (coughs) Excuse me. Let's go back to Sunday's sermon. And I hope some of you, at least a few of you were here. There was a footpath, there was a rocky soil, and there were thorny people. And the seeds are the Word of God, and the seeds are sown into the world. And of those first three, and then there was the good soil. I should say, don't leave out the good soil. So there's four categories, right? 
there's the footpath people, there's the rocky soil people, there's the thorny people, and there's the good soil. Of, that, of Jesus' parable, the first three didn't make it. They don't make it. They, they don't go to heaven. Does everybody understand that? In fact, that was what made Sunday sermon so real is that you've got to come to this conclusion that those people had encountered the word. That's the seed. The first group, the footpath people, it didn't last very long. I mean, the, the seed snatcher got it quick. The second group received it with joy. But the first time they uh, got confronted with opposition, they withered and died. They're out. The third group, they lasted a while, but they, the world got them. Anybody listening? This is the church in America. The world got them. They, they, tried, to, they, they tried to have one foot in the world and one foot in Jesus. And, and they didn't know that when you do that, the thorns, the, the vine. Y'all ever seen morning glories in the garden? How they can grow that fast is amazing to me. You can chop them out one day and you come the next day and they're back. And they, they come and they grow around your leg and they grow alongside and you don't, after a while you don't even know that they're part of you. Those people were lost. So we're talking about a narrow gate here, right? In Matthew seven thirteen, Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. That's hell. And many, many, I told you there was four categories in Jesus' parable. Many, three out of four, went to destruction. Three out of four. That's not good math. Three out of four went to destruction. So when you go to funeral home and everybody's in a better place, somebody's lying. Right? Somebody's lying. And you don't have the key. So you, you don't have the key. So you saying they're in a better place is not going to get that door open. Somebody's lying. Verse 14. Small is the gate. Narrow is the road that leads to life. Only a few are going to find it. In Jesus' parable, it's one out of four. We all have the thing that would keep us from heaven. All right? Everybody look at each other. We've all got the thing that would keep us from heaven. Don't, don't be looking at somebody else and saying, I know he ain't going to make it. <laughs> all right. We all got the thing, the thing that would keep us from heaven. What is the thing? In Jesus' parable, what is the thing? It's sin. We all got it. We all got it. And what does sin do? Again, I'm going to keep going back to that parable. Because Jesus says, if you don't understand this parable of the seed, you will never understand any of my teaching or any of the other parables. So what is it about that parable? Why, what kept the seed from producing fruit was the hardness of the heart of man. Now, listen, we're already all sinners. So, and we know that sin keeps us from the presence of God. So what is it that makes the soil of the fourth category different than the first three categories? It was soft enough to be penetrated by the seed. So you say, that guy is so hard-hearted. You know, that's a common word in our language. He's so hard. He's so hard-hearted. So, you, you know, you throw that seed out and it just hits and ricochets off. Uh, this, this seed here, it just ricochets off. It's resistant. The hard heart becomes resistant to the holy seed. But the fact is, we're all sinners. So what's the difference? It's not about the sin. It's about the heart. Once it encounters the word. I really want to make sure you get this. We are all sinners. So it won't be about the sin that gets you in the gate. It'll be what you did with the seed that hits your heart that'll separate you from the lost. 
It went in. I received it. I believed it. It went on the inside. And listen, when it comes on the inside, it changes you. It doesn't change you on the outside. It changes you on the inside. And in, in the Old Testament prophecy, it says about Israel, he says, I will take out their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. I'll take out the heart that seeds bounce off of and I will give them a heart that opens up like fertile soil and allows the seed to come in. The seed will save your life. We're all sinners. But the seed will save your life. But if your heart is hard, hardened by sin. You know, the longer you're in sin, the harder it is to get out of it. The harder, the longer you stay in it, the more you can't recognize it, and the harder it is to walk away from it. And, and what you don't realize, the longer you stay in it, and the more you resist repentance, the harder, 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 harder your heart gets until one day, I don't know where that line is, one day your heart is so hard, it'll never, ever, ever be able to receive the seed. We've all sinned and fallen short of heaven's gate. We're not good enough. Because we are sinners, we are not entitled to God's presence, which is heaven. We're not entitled. We're not entitled. Heaven is not our default location. It is not our original setting. Heaven is not our default. I said this years ago, the wind blows toward hell. If you just throw up your sails and say, woohoo, let's go. You ain't going to heaven. The wind blows toward hell. It blows toward hell. Natural man doesn't naturally go to heaven. Natural man naturally goes to hell. That's why Jesus came. That's the gospel. No one goes to heaven automatically or naturally, regardless of what you hear at funeral homes. And unless our sin problem is resolved, the only place we will go is our true default destination, which is hell. And if you die or he returns without you dealing with the sin problem, you will never enter heaven's gate. So let's, let's take this to another level. There's two, two ways to encounter God. You can die, go through the grave, or you can, he can come in the clouds. Okay? Either way, you end up in the same condition. You're going to have to be accountable for God. And unless you deal with this sin problem before that event occurs, before the grave, before the trumpet. Okay, let's call it the trumpet. Before the grave and before the trumpet, you got to deal with the sin problem. You got you to do it before. You can't get it. Everybody's going to want to repent afterwards. Right? John 8, 24. Jesus said, I told you that you would die in your sins. This is Jesus. He's got the key, right? He's got the key to heaven. I told you that you would die in your sins if you don't believe that I am the one. Now, now I want you to get this. Using that same parable I did this past Sunday. I told you, you're, gonna, you're going to die in your sin. Your sin's going to be on you when you meet Jesus. It's going to be on you. You're going to be dirty, defiled when you meet him. I told you, you're going to die in your sins if you don't what? So here's the way out of dying in your sin, right? This is the way out. This is big. If you don't believe that I am the one I claim to be. What did he claim to be? The Word. The seed. I am the seed. I am the Word. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am. I am that I am. So, unless that seed enters your hard heart, you're going to die in your sins. You're going to die in your sins. Unless, I, unless you believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed. This is Jesus. So, nobody, nobody's going to be able to get up there and say, I don't know. I don't know. And I want you to know, he's going to say, I told you, you were going to die in your sins. Unless you believe that I was the who I said I am. 
I am the seed that must enter inside your heart. And if I don't get inside of you, you're dead. You're dead. And what does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit of Christ must be living inside of you. And right now, here's the spiritual truth. Either the Holy Spirit is inside of you right now or he is not. There is no middle. There is no middle. And I, I'm going I'm to go out on a limb here. And if you don't know if he's in there or not, he's not in there. That'll be one of the future sessions. That make anybody nervous? Good. If you don't know if he's in there or not, he's not in there. Can you imagine the living God moving inside your house and you don't know it? Really? Really? Let me take a step further. Can you imagine the living God moving inside of you and you're not any different than you used to be? Really? Are you that gullible? You're different. Why do you think he says you're born again? You're born again. You're not even the same person because he's inside of you. So I got two questions. What's the hurry? And can you know for sure? What's the hurry? What's the hurry? You know, people are dying. And I think the Lord's coming. What's the hurry? We dare not wait and see when it comes to what's on the other side of death's door. You don't want to wait and see if it's reincarnation and you're going to be a horse. Or if it's hail and you're going to just be hot. You don't want to wait on the other side. We can't just cross our fingers and hope that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. What a stupid strategy. Let me give you one more. It's not in the notes. Do not, do, do not have this spiritual idea that you're, okay, I've heard that preacher. Okay, I know he believes it, but I, I'm not so sure about it. But if one day, one day they're all gone, I'm jumping in. <laughs> do not use that strategy. That if one day all those real serious kind of crazy Christians that talked about it all the time, that they're not here anymore. And you think, well, if that day comes, I'm a believer. <laughs> don't do it. Don't, don't, don't do it. Why? Why? We, we, okay, I, I need to be true to the, to the word. I believe there will be some people saved during the tribulation. Okay, I, I do believe that there will be people saved in the tribulation. But I think it'll be very difficult. And here's why. Are you ready? If you're not willing to confess Christ right now when it won't cost you anything, what's the odds of you confessing Christ in the tribulation when the Antichrist is going to cut your head off? Get a grip. If you won't do it now when it costs you nothing, you really think you're going to do it in the tribulation when they find out you did? They're going to execute you and behead you? And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded under the throne of God. That's in Revelation. Can we know for sure we're going to go to heaven? Now, that's, that's the teaser for next week, okay? The voice that whispers in your ear, there's no hurry, is not the voice of God. The voice that says in your ear, you can come next week and deal with that, is not God. Let me give you uh, something you may not know. Do, do you know that in, in the entire Bible, in the entire Bible, in the entire Bible, there is not one delayed baptism? Zero. You ever wonder why? In fact, the story of, of Paul and the jailer. You all know the story? Paul and the jailer. Paul is broken out of jail supernaturally by God in the middle of the night. The bars open up and, and he's going to let them go. And the jailer, it's a Roman jail. And if you let your prisoners grow in your Roman jail, you, the, they execute you. So he's going to fall on his sword. 
I'd rather me kill me than you all kill me. So he's going to fall on his sword and Paul stops him. And Paul shares the gospel. He, Paul shares the, the God who opens jails in the middle of the night with the jailer. And it says that the jailer and all of his family came to faith in Christ. And in that very hour, it's in the middle of the night, they go and baptize all of them. Why? Why? Just be logical. Why would you? Why wouldn't you wait till the daybreak? Why? Urgency. In that moment, they had an encounter with God. Now listen, I am not against delayed baptisms. I do delayed baptisms. I don't recommend them. I wish you wouldn't do them. But I'd rather do your baptism later than not do your baptism. My point is not that. My point is this. If in that moment you stood and saw heaven and hell, in that moment your eyes were open and you saw heaven and hell, life and death, do you really think you would say, well, catch me next Wednesday? Or would you say, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? You see the difference? There's a sense of urgency. Years ago, I did a sermon, and, and I can't remember what I called it, but here was the point. If, I think I called it three seconds. Maybe I didn't. Three seconds. And here, here's, here's the sermon point. Of everyone in the room tonight, if I gave you three seconds in two positions, three, transform everything about your life. If I gave you three seconds to take one eye and look through a knot hole of the fence of heaven, Three seconds. All you get is a three-second view into heaven. And then I turn you around and I give you a three-second view into hell. Three seconds. You would never be the same. And here's the point of the sermon. This series is going to last way more than three seconds. And God has given you a very clear view of both. And the question is, do you believe him? There's the difference. Do you believe what he's revealing to you about heaven and hell? <clears throat> it's a choice. It's a choice. I can't believe for you. You can't believe for me. You can't believe for your spouse, your children. Joshua 24, this Old Testament. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, okay. Okay. Listen, I get it. I get it. You know what keeps me from going insane in the ministry? I look at somebody and says, if you don't want to serve the Lord, fine. I'll move on to somebody else. At some point, I'll just shake the dust off my feet and move on. I can't just stay here with you. If, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. That You want to serve Satan? Serve him. I'm not going with you. Choose for yourselves whom you will serve. Whether the gods of the forefathers you serve beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites, there's all kinds of false gods in the, whose land you are now living. But as for me and my house, that's for me and my house, we're choosing. What? I, I looked through that three-second knot hole and I saw heaven. I looked through that three-second knot hole. I saw hell. This ain't hard. This ain't hard. When I left Itachi back in 2002, my co-workers gave me a beautiful framed document that says these words, but as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. It's a great memory. Why? They knew why I was quitting. Because God had called me to go preach. And I want everybody to know this. And listen, if you know me, you know that at least after you get to know me, you're going to know one thing. He believes it. You might not, but you'll, you'll know this. I do. I want people to know that me and my wife, Janet, and our family, we've chosen. I've chosen. I ain't going back. I've chosen. And it's urgent for me. 2 Corinthians 6 2. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. 
I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. There is an urgency to choosing sides. Why does he say now is the time of God's favor? Now is the day of salvation. Why now? Because in that moment, the Holy Spirit has done something. He has put a seed in the soil of your heart, and he's seeing whether it's going to go on in or whether you're going to take it out. And he wants it to go in, but you don't want, you're resisting it. Now is the day of salvation. Now. Why is that a big deal? There is no guarantee that he's going to come back again and open that door. There's no guarantee. you got no guarantee. That, that's, that's one of the problems with the American church. It has this idea that the door's always open and you can just come in anytime you want to. Maybe I'll wait until things get really bad and jump in at that last minute. Twice in the Gospel of John, two times in the Gospel of John, Jesus says no one can come to the Son unless the Father draws them. It's a work of God. It's a work of the Spirit. He, ho- he opens a door that no one can close. And he closes the door that no one can open. He's got the door, not me. The church doesn't have the door. He's opening and shutting the door. Today's the day of salvation. Today, right now. Why would you tell the creator of the universe, I'll get back to you? Choosing Jesus is called faith. And faith in Jesus opens heaven's gate. He could have used any way in the world to have to to manifest the key. You know what he chose? Uh, this is one of those theological questions always spins in my brain. You know, God could have said, "You got to go to Jordan River and be baptized in June, and I'll save you." Uh, he could do that. He's God, right? He could say, "You got to make a trek to Mount Everest." Somewhere when you're, when you're 28 years old. I mean, he could have done anything. He said, that, I'll save you if. But he said one thing. I'll save you by faith. Now, I've, I've thought about this for years. It's the one thing anybody can do. You cannot control what I believe. I cannot control what you believe. That's on the inside of me, and you cannot access that lever, that button. You can't do it. And I can't access yours. It's just me. I I control that little button in there saying, believe, not believe. And right now, you're in charge of your button. And you believe this, what's going on tonight, or you don't believe this, it's you. And God says, I'll That'll be the gateway. It'll be, you, be, you chose to believe. Now, I'm not taking out the Holy Spirit's divine providence. It's in there too. But, but listen, ultimately, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we've chosen. Right? So, I'm going to... Um, Pause for a moment with that question. Let me ask you a question. If you died today, are you certain you'd go to heaven rather than hell? Please don't answer out loud. Okay? Especially if it's in like screaming or something. We'll talk to you after church. If you died tonight, or if the trumpet sounds tonight, do you know where your soul's going to go. So, I'm going to give you a look through the knot hole of hell. Hell is a place created by God for the punishment of Satan and his fallen angels. Do, do you know that? The Bible specifically says God did not make hell for people. Do you know that? I, I find that reassuring. I don't know about you. He made hell for Satan and the angelic realm that joined Satan in the rebellion. Let me show it to you. Um, Matthew 25. Then he will say to those on his left, you don't want to be on the left. Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for people. No, no, no. Prepared for the devil and his angels. 
the eternal fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry. You know, why, why, are you going, why are you on the left? He's separating the sheep and the goats. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. You did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick in prison. You didn't look after me. Then also, they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick and in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away, listen carefully, into eternal punishment, that's for the goats, but the righteous to eternal life, that's for the sheep. He's going to separate the sheep and the goats. Eternal punishment eternal life. Eternal punishment, eternal life. But he designed it, created it, put it out there for Satan and his angels. Revelation 20. This is Satan's judgment day. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Tormented day and night. Even though it was created for Satan and his fallen angels, there will be people there too. Why? People who have rejected the eternal salvation offered through the blood of Christ who died for their sins. Revelation 20. People who joined Satan. If you don't join Jesus, you are by default joining the adversary of Jesus. You don't get a third choice. You either join Jesus or you join his adversary. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead are judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Now, I would really like to have time to go into where, where are, where's death and Hades that now can be transferred to eternity. I don't have time to go into that, maybe later. Death and Hades will then be thrown into the eternal lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not writ found written in the book of life, he was thrown. These are people. Satan wasn't made for these. I mean, hell wasn't made for these people. Hell was made for Satan and his angels. But these people joined Satan. They became part of Satan, so they're going to get what Satan gets. They're connected to Satan, so they're going to get what he gets. They're thrown into the lake of fire. This kind of dispels the funeral home logic. He's in a better place. This is not a better place. This torment never stops. It is an everlasting suffering. Just as sure as heaven is a physical place of eternally blessed, hell is a physical place of the eternally cursed. Hell is a place of fire, darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place of conscious punishment, of sins without any hope of relief. Most preachers today don't want to talk about hell. It's not very seek or sensitive. It doesn't make people feel good. Hell is a real place where real people are going to spend a real eternity without a real Savior. People there will have, a, will have physical bodies. I cannot fathom in my mind what that's going to be like. But they will have some type of a physical body. Those bodies will feel pain and suffering, but will be unable to die forever. Do you think you're being compassionate when you neglect telling somebody about hell? Do you think you're loving somebody by never bringing this up? Jesus loves people. Do you know that Jesus said more about hell than anyone else? He brought it up. Heaven is even more beautiful when you know about hell. It's even more wonderful. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body. Soul and body. You got a body. You got a body. Inhale. Matthew 13. Jesus said, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, 
So it will be at the end of the age. Harvest time. The Son of Man will send out His angels and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and does e and, and all evil and all who do evil. They will be thrown. These are people will be thrown into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mark 9, 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and go to hell where the fire never goes out. What, what is the, do you understand what he means? If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If there's something you can't handle around you, cut it off. If there's something around you that drags you into the darkness, you, while you still have strength, cut it off. Get it out of your life. I, I give you an example that a lot of men struggle with. Pornography. And if you're in the room today and you, you're into pornography and you think it's a secret and God doesn't know, you're a foolish man. He knows. And if that's causing you to sin, if that's causing you to sin, cut it off. If that computer or that phone is call, opening a doorway for you to participate in pornography, get rid of it out of your life. Save your soul. Save your soul. Abstain from sexual sin. If there's a relationship that you're in and you cannot control your sexual passions and you know that you are living in sin before God because of your sexual passions, cut off that relationship. Get away. Get out. Run. And would you really trade sex for hell? Really? That's like a bowl of soup. For a birthright. It's just stupid. I remember there was a guy, and he was in adultery. His wife told me he was in adultery. I scheduled a meeting between the two of them. And when, he, when they both are in my office, I, I ask a question I often ask. Do you fear God? I just ask, do you, do you fear God? Because I do. You know, and I look at your life, and I, 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 I'm afraid for you. And you know what his answer was? You know what his answer was? I mean, you don't want, you want to put somebody on the spot. Do you fear God? And his answer was, he immediately started rationalizing why he's in adultery. If you knew her, you'd understand why I went and got another woman. That's what he said. If you knew her, she's in the room. Then you'd understand why I went and got another woman. One of the most graphic stories that Jesus talks about hell is the rich man and Lazarus. As I read it tonight, I want you to look at these seven points. Listen carefully. I told you, if you could look three seconds through the knot hole of hell, you, you'd think heaven looks really good tonight. So seven things. Is hell... Uh, in, excuse me, in hell, the wicked suffer terribly. In hell, they are fully conscious. They, are, they retain their desires. They retain their memories and their reasoning. They long for relief and cannot be comforted. In hell, they cannot leave their place of torment. And in hell, there is no hope. There is no escape. Seven things. Seven, seven things. Now, where do I get those seven things? Here we go. This is Jesus telling the story. He's got the key. There was a rich man that was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores. And longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. So you got the beggar in the story. Um, and he's carried to Abraham's side. The rich man, the, the, the beggar is Lazarus. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment. 
he, the rich man, looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, is a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And he answered, then I beg you, Father, listen carefully. I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I wonder if it's the first time in that man's life he ever thought of somebody besides himself. Send someone to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him, Lazarus, warn them, so they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Y'all see what that sentence is? Someone did come from the dead. His name's Jesus. And people still don't want to repent. If someone from the dead came, they would repent. And he said, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone like Jesus rises from the dead. They'll still not repent. There's a part of all of us that doesn't want to believe in hell. Why would a loving God make such an awful place Some say it's a clever, frightening motivator that churches use to improve their attendance portfolio. I don't know how that would work. Or is it a real place where real people will spend a real eternity without a real Savior? You can't refuse to believe in hell without also refusing to believe in Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that told us the most about hell. So here's a story I want to use. I used this years ago. And it has particular meaning, maybe even now more than ever. What if one foggy morning I left the house very early, it's still dark, and headed for a hospital visit in Lexington. When I popped over the hill at Tyrone Bridge, something told me something's wrong. I slowed down to find out that the bridge overnight had fallen. It's gone. Would I turn around at the bottom of the hill and head for the Bluegrass Parkway? Or would I put on my flashers, wave my arms, and stop the cars heading down the hill toward their certain death? Which one? Is it unloving to speak of hell? Not if it's true. Can any of you see yourself turning around at the bottom of the Tyrone Hill there and just coming up and maybe chuckling at the fact that all those cars in the fog are going to go over, they're all about to die? Would you, would you think, or, or would you in that moment feel some sense of responsibility? I, 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 I got to find a way to stop them. They're, they're going to all die. They're going to all die. They're going to all die. No one's going to survive that. That's hell. Without Jesus, they're going to all die. And the moment you get this, the moment you get it, having that conversation with your family member that's an unbeliever becomes a sense of urgency. You you turn the car sideways in the road to stop your child from going over the edge of the cliff. You'd, you'd, you'd get out and wave your arms. You'd do anything to stop those cars going down the hill. Yes, you would. But yet you think this isn't real. You see how Satan works? Love demands a warning. Satan's lie is that heaven is a boring, ghostly place and there is no hell. Satan wants us to believe that our purpose and fulfillment is in this very short and temporary life on earth. 
You know what he wants you to do? Eat, drink, and be merry. Everyone's going to a better place. You'd be mad if you went to the doctor and he didn't offer you the cure to your sickness when it was readily available. What kind of doctor would it be? Sin is a cancer that has a 100% mortality rate. And the loving thing to do is to announce the diagnosis. The diagnosis is sin. And to announce the cure. The cure is Jesus. And to not announce the diagnosis and to not announce the cure is the most cruel thing you will ever do in your life. Listen, I have this horrible thought of someone looking at me on judgment day as they are cast into the fire and saying, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? It is loving to announce the truth about the consequences that are coming for those who refuse to accept the cure. So I want to wrap up tonight by reading a portion from Randy Alcorn's book. It is so powerful, at least it is to me. This is what Randy Alcorn wrote. God and Satan are not equal opposites. Likewise, hell is not heaven's equal opposite. Just as God has no equal as a person, heaven has no equal as a place. Hell will be agonizingly dull, small, and insignificant without company, camaraderie, purpose, or accomplishment. It will not have its own stories. It will merely be a footnote in history, a crack in the pavement. As the new universe moves gloriously onward, hell and its occupants will exist in utter inactivity and insignificance and eternal non-life of regret and perhaps diminishing personhood. This is what the scripture says about those who die without Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord And from his majesty and his power. Now this continues Randy Alcorn's quote. Because God is the source of all good. And hell is the absence of God. Hell must also be the absence of all good. Hell will have no community, no camaraderie, no friendship. I don't believe hell is a place where demons take delight in punishing people. And where people commiserate over their fate. More likely, each person is in solitary confinement, just as the rich man is portrayed alone in hell. Misery loves company, but there will be nothing to love in hell. Right now, earth is an in-between world, touched by both heaven and hell. Earth leads directly into heaven and directly into hell, affording a choice between the two. The best of life on earth is a glimpse of heaven. I want you to think of the best thing you've ever experienced on earth. It's a glimpse of heaven. The worst of life is a glimpse of hell. For Christians, this present life is the closest they will ever come to hell. For unbelievers, it is the closest they will ever come to heaven. The reality of the choice that lies before us in this life is both wonderful and awful. Given the reality of the two possible destinations, shouldn't we be willing to pay any price to avoid hell and go to heaven? And yet the price has already been paid. What's the price? Revelation 5, 9. And they sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, Jesus, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Now you hear this tonight and at this conference I went to on Monday and Tuesday with the staff and we've kind of come up with this thing that we want to have happen at Nineveh Christian Church. 
And one of our goals, fundamental goals on the staff, and we want the entire church to embrace the goal. We want Anderson County. We want to make Anderson County the hardest place in Kentucky to go to hell from. I won't say it again. We'd like to make Anderson County the hardest place in this state to go to hell from. And because this church would be on a mission to share this wonderful good news. You don't have to die and be lost. And we want to make it really tough for you to go to hell from this place. That's the church. That's why we're here. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Philippi. And I believe he tells them the truth as revealed to him through the Holy Spirit of Christ. Here's the conclusion of the matter of heaven and hell. Philippians 3.18. For as I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. When he says stomach, people get thrown by that. What he's saying is their God is their physical appetites, their desires. Their God is their desires. You're living in the flesh. And their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. And everybody said, hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a contrast in those four verses. One group lives to satisfy their pleasure. The other group lives to satisfy Jesus as we eagerly await His return. So what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? Some people's minds are on earthly things only, and let's let's be honest. If that's what you're looking for and looking at, that's where you're going. And he says, stop looking at the stuff. Keep, set your mind and your eyes on things above. Think about and eagerly await a Savior from there. So if you died tonight, I'm going to stop there. If the trumpet blasts tonight, where are you? Where are you? It, nobody's good enough. I'm not good enough. No one's done enough. You can't do enough. Did the seed penetrate the soil? Did the seed penetrate the soil? Is Jesus who he says he is? Is heaven real? Is hell real? Do we really stand at crossroads between the two? And Jesus said, if you'll just let me in, if you'll let me in, I'll make a place for you in heaven forever. I'll give you a new body. What a deal. But if you don't let me in, and you retain control of your hard heart, I will cast you out into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So with an ending like that, I offer an invitation tonight. I do. I offer an invitation. I don't know who's in this room. There's about 200 of you. 200, maybe more than 200. Um, Maybe 250. I don't know. But I'm going to stay up here. I'm going to make this the hardest place in the world to go to hell from. I'm going to stay up here. And if if you're in this room tonight, and you don't know, and you don't know, You can know. But you'll have to deny yourself to take up this cross to follow him. You'll you'll let let denying yourself breaks your heart. It does. It breaks you. And in that brokenness, he enters you. And you stop being God and he starts being God. 
And you lose control and he gains control. And when he gains control, you gain life. Eternal life. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for mercy and grace because none of us deserve any of this. We all deserve hell and you gave us heaven. And Father, we worship you. I worship you. I adore you. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God that saves us from hell's flames. So Father, awaken your bride. Awaken us to the urgency of the hour we live in. Father, send us out of here to this message that heaven's real, hell's real, Jesus is real, forgiveness of sins is real. Send us out into this dark world with this light of truth that saves people from eternal death. Now, Father, if there's somebody here tonight that doesn't know you, and today is their day of salvation, Father, take away everything in them that would keep them from receiving this glorious seed, which is Christ in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.